Welcome to this Ruler Waves 3 guide to trade and mine warfare. In my Germany 1935 playthrough, a question arose about what's the kind of right size for the German U boat fleet. And because I asked that question, I got some fantastic poll results from you. It also kind of unpacked a little bit well, what's the wider questions and all options around trade warfare? And then that dragged you off into uh, mine warfare as well. So I've put together this little guide to share with you what I've found out so far. Terms and conditions apply. The game deliberately does not tell you everything about the algorithms that work underneath so that people can't, um, you know, go off and min-max them. Here's the poll results. Really interesting. I asked um, a spread of U-boat sizes from 20 which I've described as a minimum. It also happened to be the number that I started the Germany 1935 scenario with. 40, which seemed to be kind of like a minimum if you were serious about having kind of any impact on the enemy's trade. 60, which seemed like a big force. 80, bigger and plus 100. If you're serious about this and you want to use submarines as a war winning strategy. The results, I think, were really interesting. So only 6% felt that, you know, essentially not bothering with submarines was a good idea. Nearly a third of you were quite happy with 40 as a nice size. You're sort of, you know, let's not go crazy, but it's still a significant force. And just over a third of you kind of hedged your bets in this sort of middling space between not really focusing on submarines a lot and some focusing on them a great deal. 80 was, was actually quite disliked, you know, sort of not big enough if you're going to go big, whereas uh, nearly one in five of you were keen on a large submarine force with the potential to win wars for you. Also the potential to widen wars by <laughs> uh, uh, sinking liners and annoying neutral opinion. So, Thanks for that. That was great. That was really interesting. But then it kind of raised the question in my mind, well, what are the fuller options around this? Because it's not just around submarines. There are alternatives. So here's a list of a typical range of alternatives. I've listed them from the most chrome-plated, largest, most ridiculous uh, one you could have, which is a, a 24 five knot 26,000 ton liner which has other uses but is rubbish uh, on trade warfare down to a dedicated like cruiser a, a dedicated seaplane carrier a large submarine a fast armed merchant cruiser relatively a mine laying submarine an ordinary submarine a tramp steamer, really slow, small uh, armed merchant cruiser, and then finally your coastal submarine. And I've evaluated them against a number of different criteria. So first of all, cost. How much do they take to build and how much do they take to operate for the first five years? I could have done 10 or 15, but it seemed representative enough. Uh, doing longer doesn't really change these ratios uh, at all because bigger ships cost more and then to put that more as a choice if we set our gold-plated liner as 100 percent what is the relative value of all the others so down at your little coastal submarine it only costs nine percent of the cost of a liner or perhaps in more concrete terms if you buy one liner you could have bought 11 coastal submarines or eight and a third rubbishy slow little tramp uh, armed merchant cruisers or five ordinary submarines and so on and then another consideration is the build time so it only takes four months to convert any of the armed merchant cruisers now yes technically it takes another four or five months to fully work them up but then you've got the option of committing them to a raiding role before they're fully uh, worked up, which will have bad consequences if they get caught. But then if they get caught, 
it's probably bad anyhow. And it probably uh, will mean they're a, a less effective raider as well. True quality is a factor that goes throughout the game. And then finally, where could they operate? Could they operate in adjacent sea zones to the sea zone in which they were originally based? So for coastal submarines, the answer is no. Uh, for other submarines, uh, standard ones and mine laying submarines, the answer is yes, with a penalty, the asterisk is if there's no friendly base in that adjacent sea zone. For other ones, the double asterisk is yes, you can go to adjacent sea zones. So long as you're not short ranged, um, if you're medium or more ranged, you're fine. Although obviously, if you go over base capacity in that sea zone, you will suffer fatigue and your crew quality will decline and therefore your performance will decline as well. So an interesting choice of options. I'll go into the advantages and disadvantages. For the submarine, it's worth noting that you also have their trade attack policies. So you can commit the submarine fleet to fleet support or to prize rules, trade warfare or unrestricted trade warfare. They each have these different qualities. So on fleet support, obviously the priority is on attacking warships. They don't really attack trade. They therefore don't risk raising neutral tensions, nor do they cause unrest with your enemy, which would help end the war. They are effective, even if there uh, is a blockade, if you're blockading the enemy. Um, and they are effective if you are blockaded. The prize rules is more balanced. I, I assume the prize rules um, were different from the fleet support, but actually they're a, they're a middling thing. So yes, they still attack warships, which I didn't realize, and they attack trade. They, is a, there is a risk, it's a low or lower risk of increasing tensions if you sink a liner, which you know I have seen. They will cause enemy unrest, weakening their will to continue the war, but more slowly. Their effectiveness, if you are blockading, is reduced because if you're blockading, there's no um, merchant ships really to attack. So it's only attacking uh, warships. So you might as well put it on fleet support. And if you are blockaded, then yeah, it's fine. And then finally, if you go full Monty and go unrestricted, then you don't attack warships. Your priority is fully committed to attacking trade. There's a high risk that this is going to sink a liner or two, and it will impact on tensions, and it could bring additional enemies into your war, which will both make your war more difficult and, of course, will rubbish uh, any victory points you've gathered up to that point. It will cause the enemy unrest, and it is not effective at all if you are blockading your enemy. If you are blockaded, <laughs> it's a great tool. Surface raiders, just for comparisons, obviously don't attack warships. They do attack trade. They don't risk neutral tensions. They do cause enemy unrest by sinking merchant ships. They are not effective if you are blockading, because again, there are no merchant, enemy merchant ships to sink. And if you are blockaded, then they have to break out and there's a risk that they will be detected and brought to battle. Trade attack options. So I've resorted these by how many you get per liner. So putting the coastal submarine up at the top, um, it's certainly best for unrestricted warfare because you are spamming the um, your enemy with a whole host of cheap submarines. It doesn't matter how many really you lose because you can churn them out more quickly than you can any other type of submarine. So they're very useful for saturating the sea zone, particularly if that sea zone is your home base and the enemy's base as well. The Tramp Merchants Armed Cruiser. Um, so long as it's not being uh, a blockade, if we are imposing a blockade for any of the ships, there's no point doing them. 
Um, they can operate further afield. They will force the enemy to deploy light cruisers and their own fast armed merchant cruisers to deal with these tramp Dima armed merchant cruisers. And, you know, you're getting twice the number as you are for a relatively fast one. So this tramp one has a speed, I think, of 13 knots. This relatively fast one has a speed of like 21. So double the number. So yeah, they'll they'll be lost in droves. But again, they only take four months to build and a few months to work up as long as you want until you commit them. So I think they're quite an interesting uh, and viable option if you want to go for a sort of saturation war winning uh, approach to this your basic run of the mill submarine i think you know is very useful you get five for the cost of a liner so yeah it, it's half the number of coastal submarines but they are substantially more capable they can go to more one uh, sea zone particularly if there's a good base there and they are more attack capable. The mine laying submarines, I think, are useful, particularly pre-1930. So pre-1930, if you sink a liner because of mines, you don't raise the tensions in the same way that you would do if it was torpedoed. After 1930, that's not true anymore. I did do one game in which I built quite a lot of mine laying submarines and they seemed to sink quite a lot. Whether that was just an unlucky thing, I'm not sure. Your fast armed merchant cruiser, 21 knots, is again excellent for forcing your enemy to deploy their light cruisers on trade protection. It's a real sink of resources that could be put to better use if you want to go down that route. The large submarine, which if you think about it only in submarine terms, looks amazingly expensive, is only middling expensive here. It's very flexible and it's excellent if you don't have any bases in adjacent areas, then it really pushes out your submarine envelope and makes them much more effective over a large area. Your raiding seaplane carriers are Again, really useful for forcing out uh, light cruisers. The fact that they have a seaplane is also uh, helps their effectiveness as raiders. Your light cruiser, which of course could be fitted with a seaplane, again is a drag on the enemy's light cruiser force, but then it's a drag on your light cruiser force as well. Relatively, it's quite expensive because it's armored and you know it's a proper serious warship. Whereas the radar seaplane carrier very much isn't. It's unprotected. It may only have a small number of guns and its seaplanes. And then you may fit it out with a few other things as well. And then finally, the liner is um, a vanity project that's really only good if you want to do a very cheap early carrier conversion. It's not an, a, a trade attack option. The advantages, oh sorry, the disadvantages. So coastal submarines, limited torpedo tubes and torpedo capacity, and they can't move sea areas in wartime. The tramp steamer is effectively defenseless. Your ordinary submarine is good, but it's less effective if you go into adjacent areas. Your mine laying submarine also has a limited torpedo tube uh, capacity because it's carrying mines as well. And after 1930, it will be blamed for sinking liners. Your fast armed merchant cruiser is has a weak defense. I mean, it's not as defenseless as the Tramp, but you know, it's still nothing to write home about. And it would be lucky to ever survive a combat with a proper cruiser or, you know, even. 50-50 against another armed merchant cruiser. The large submarine is expensive-ish. And the Raider seaplane carrier is also expensive-ish, but, you know, is also pretty defenseless if someone catches up with it. Your raiding light cruiser 
is relatively, compared to all these others, very expensive, but, you know, it is at least a proper warship. And the liner, as we've discussed, is, um, is a bit bonkers in terms of trade attack. It's, it's a carrier conversion. Quite complicated, and you can't reverse engineer it. From what I've read and understand, it goes something like this. The number of submarines uh, you have in an area modified by the submarine effectiveness research. Though in my 1933 game, I've got three submarine effectiveness research levels, and there's another seven to come. It's also modified negatively by base support, or more correctly, probably lack of base support. Against that, you have your trade protection ships in an area. So destroyers and corvettes, including your minesweepers, and later ships with helicopters. And um, actually, even early on, your, your carriers have a very modest ASW value as well. Also, our merchant cruisers are notionally Q ships, but that's a very minor one. And they are modified by your crew quality. So, you know, memo to self, do not put all of your corvettes into mothballs in peacetime to save a bit of money and then mobilize them at war when their quality is poor because they're going to be poor ASW ships. If you do mothball them, bring them out of mothballs as tensions go to yellow and certainly into orange so that they've got the time to work up into being proper effective units. It's modified by the ASW effectiveness research. There are nine of those in the 35 in my game and seven more to come. They're modified by naval patrol aircraft in the area, but it's not really clear how or what kind of impact or ratio they have. Um, naval patrol aircraft do have an ASW value and you can find that out in your um, screen for your how many airplanes you've got. It's also modified by your intelligent efforts, which I didn't know. So if you have high intelligence, you'll be much more aware of where the enemy submarines are going than if you have low or indeed no intelligence. There's, there's a lot to it now, and a lot of it is transparent. After your trade warfare attack has been calculated, one ASW ship at random attacks one submarine at random in that area. And that's the thing that pops up as a message saying after a spirited duel, blah, blah, blah. The trade attack effectiveness is even less knowable. I've, I've made a, a, an estimate. So it goes on something like the number of submarines and raiders their build time and their lifetime. So how much do they cost? Well, we do know that. Per enemy merchant ship sunk. Well, you can sort of estimate that, but you can't really know it. Per the unrest level that you'll cause your enemy because they're being starved out by these attacks and they're sinking their merchant ships. And that's not really known at all. Minus the number of submarines and raiders that you're going to lose every turn. Again, you can sort of estimate that. Versus the cost per enemy trade protection resource, how many corvettes and destroyers. So I've estimated that you're going to be drawing in all of their corvettes and perhaps half of their destroyers is quite common. Here's a sort of example of that worked out. So imagine you've got 60 submarines and four light cruisers that you put to raiding, and you've built 10 armed merchant cruisers as raiders. Here are the relative costs of all of those forces. So it will cost just a little less than half a million to create this trade attack force, this blended trade attack force. You might expect, ish, to sink 12 merchant ships a turn. And let's say, for the sake of argument, that that causes half an unrest level a turn. I've just totally made that up. But if that were true, then you would defeat the enemy in about 20 months. 
if you lose a couple of submarines and a raider per month, and if 40 uh, submarines and 20 raiders were lost over those 20 months, so you'd have to add to this cost to you know, have rebuilds and replacements, then, you know, you'd be costing yourself a lot of money. But, you know, if you do get this 20 months of defeat, it would be worth it. Against this force of yours, of course, the enemy is deploying vessels on trade protection, and that could be anywhere between 35 and maybe 70 with these costs, 280 to 560. So potentially they're paying as much as you're paying to defend against your attack. Now, there's a lot of ums and ahs and assumptions in this, but I just wanted to kind of illustrate how it might go if uh, you were able to achieve this 20 month uh, defeat. It's not the only thing. Obviously the disparity in victory levels from all of your battles is a significant factor in this unrest, as well as the impact of your trade attack, as well as any blockade. Obviously if it's a full blockade, then there's no point attacking the trade because it's already fully rubbished. Next, we have submarine attack on the fleet whilst not in a battle. It's those occasional uh, instances where submarines go and just gratuitously sink one of your warships during the monthly turn. And the formula for this seems to be very much the same. Your submarines in the area modified by their effectiveness and the degree of base support versus the number of anti-submarine warfare ships in the area that aren't on trade protection. Uh, as a ratio to the number of heavy ships that they are protecting, modified by um, helicopters, crew quality, ASW effectiveness research, the number of naval patrol aircraft that you have, but again, it's not clear how, and by, again, your intelligence effort. And again, if there is a submarine attack, then a submarine itself is attacked by a random anti ASW vessel in the area. So the same kind of formula, but it relates to ships that aren't on trade protection and is attacking your fleet units rather than your uh, merchants. Finally, submarine attack during a battle. So submarines can spawn in your battles. And again, it's the submarine detected versus the submarine effectiveness research and the nearest ASW ship in the battle, which again is usually going to be a destroyer, could later be something with a helicopter modified by the crew quality and modified by the ASW effectiveness research. ASW ship attacks first and if it's successful it, it'll sink the submarine. If it's not successful it will force the submarine to deep dive and not activate again for some time because it takes a while for the submarine to, um, to go and hide and the battle's moved on and all of that. So yes, obviously if the submarine isn't detected then there isn't an ASW attack and then it has an opportunity to go and attack one of your ships. Finally, or penultimately, over to mine warfare, and we'll have a little look, first of all, at mine laying. So there are, I think, three different types of mine laying. So first of all, there's the big semicircular defensive minefields around your bases, which are automatically generated, and you as the enemy cannot enter an enemy's minefield around that. Secondly, there are the small minefields, some of which are friendly, and some of which are suspected that the enemy's laid, and they're generated near coastal batteries and near bases, and the enemy might hit them during battle. Actually, you might hit them too, so it's probably best, even if it's a friendly one, not to just stay all over the top of one. These small minefields tend to get thicker the longer a war goes on, and they are adjusted by the relative number of mine layers to mine sweepers in your area. The more mine layers to mine sweepers, the more minefields get laid. The more mine sweepers, the more they get removed. Thirdly, there's the the whole area, the whole sea zone you're in, it's mine for 
mine warfare ratio between the mine layers and the mine sweepers. That includes submarines. It doesn't seem to include airplanes. Airplanes don't seem to drop mines, which they certainly did in World War II. Perhaps that's a tech coming in the future. Ships of the raiding have their mine laying capacity halved because presumably they're doing other things as well. Mine warfare. So there's a pre-battle round of mining and mine sweeping for ships in the area, which might produce a result. There's the operational mine warfare round each month. So that's one of those random messages that pops up, which crucially depends on the percentage of mine sweeping vessels you have against the number of big ships that you have, against the number of mine layers that the enemy has. Some mine strikes might be misreported as torpedo hits. So some of these, you may go, oh no, where did that submarine come from? Where, in fact, there was no submarine in the area, it's probably a mine. It's just that, you know, they're big underwater explosions and they're easy to confuse. There is a thing that the manual says that Germany blocks passage between the North Sea and the Baltic once active mine warfare is researched, which is a relatively early research thing. But I think this is questionable. I've, I've certainly seen the Soviet Union sending ships into the North Sea, unless they're coming from sort of Murmansk and Archangel, actually. I'll, I'll check that. The mine warfare variables, so mine sweeping values are your destroyers and your corvettes appear to give 16 to your area's minesweeping value. So each minesweeper seems to contribute 16. I don't think there's any different adjustment by displacement or something like that. So far as I can see, if it has minesweeping gear, it adds 16 to the sea zone's minesweeping value. So that's pretty simple. Uh, in comparison, the mine laying for a sea zone area seems to be quite variable. I had a look at the ones rel relative to my Germany 1935 game. And in Northern Europe, I had 200 mines available on ships in the active fleet, 69 on ships that were doing trade protection, 92 that were on ships doing working up. I'm assuming as usual, ships working up don't count. I had no mines on raiders and I have no submarine mine layers. The area was given a value in the area tab of 261, which works out at 0 0.88 per mine. Well, okay. I did the same calculation in the Baltic where I've got 268 mines on different ships in the active fleet and nothing for all of the others. And its value is 218, which is 0 0.81. I don't know why they're different. I don't know if mines on trade protection are halved or, or some such, which, but even that actually wouldn't make sense. That would make this value lower rather than have this one where they all are in the active fleet. This should be higher if uh, there was any kind of stuff going on. So I don't know. If you do know, I'd love to hear. And that's it really for coverage around uh, submarines and raiders and mine warfare. It is a bit of a sort of shell game, a game within a game, but it's, it's like a small one. And because the game designer has decided to make this process quite opaque, it's um, difficult to know exactly what to, you can't gamify it. You can't exactly get it down to, oh yes, I need to do exactly this number of minesweepers or exactly this number of anti-submarine ships, or indeed exactly this number of ships to have the effects that I want. So you're, you're dealing with the unknowns and you're having to, yes, for want of a better term, uh, I hope this short guide helps you guess a little bit better and a little bit more informed and you understand some of the costs that you're bearing when you build up either a big submarine fleet or a big raider fleet or a big mine warfare fleet. And you equally understand the costs that you're imposing on your opponent who has to respond in kind. Otherwise, 
I hope you've enjoyed this, and thanks very much for watching.